All right, as I mentioned, we have a guest speaker. Um, he is the founder and president of Glad News for Muslims. Why don't you help me welcome up Sammy Tanago. Abraham one day 
did not only watch his son being murdered, but actually was taking his son in one hand and a knife to butcher him. Was the other? Was he a good prophet? Was he a good father? Would you agree with me that if Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son to God, then he proved his sacrificial love to God? Muslims usually agree. And we tell Muslims that's exactly what God wants you to discover about himself. His sacrificial love for you. Because we read in Romans 5, verse 8, God demonstrated his own love toward us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. My Muslim friend, would you agree with me that if Abraham was willing to give his son to God, then he proved beyond any doubt that he is willing to give God everything and anything he has? Muslim will say, yeah, of course. He was willing to give his son. That's exactly what God wants you to discover about himself. Because we read in the Gospel, actually open the Gospel, Romans 8, verse 32, He who did not spare his own son, God, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? If God gave us his son, <laughs> then he's going to give us the best life we can ever have here on earth and he's going to take us to be with him forever if you are not sure would you put your faith in Jesus now and you will experience God's love and you will know that Jesus is your only savior if you repent of your sins and believe in Jesus and you will know that God will give you the best life and God will live within you and he will be with you every day and he will take you to be with him forever. <laughs> so now we answer their questions not only in the best way biblically and humanly possible, but we actually help them to see the beauty and the logic of the, our Christian faith. Very important. Okay, let me give you uh, more of the big picture. We know from Genesis 12, God told Abraham, I will bless you and through you, huh? Talk to me. You, you sound sleepy. Are you still? Uh, through you, all underline the word all. Let's be a little charismatic today. It's okay. All. God want to bless all the families of the earth. Not only Abraham and the Jewish people. Uh -uh. <laughs> Big mistake. <laughs> no. God he chose Abraham and he chose the Jewish people to bless them. Yes. He loves them. Yes. He chose them. Yes. But to be a blessing. Same thing for you and me. God chose us, he loves us, he brought us to a good church, gave us good teaching, Calvary Chapel, because he loves us, yes, but not any more than he loves the people that yet don't know Jesus. Genesis 17, God promised Abraham, as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful. Wow! Ishmael, yes! Genesis 16, God promised Hagar to multiply her descendants exceedingly. Descendants of Hagar, the Muslim people, the Arab people. Wow! Verse 11, God himself Here, Hagar's affliction, and God himself named Hagar unborn son Ishmael, which means God hears. Aha! 
God hears. Genesis 21. God heard Ishmael. Crying. Crying. Now, when we cry, who hears our cry? God. God does. You better believe it. And if you keep walking with him, you will know that he is going to answer your heart cry. And he will satisfy your heart. And he will bless your life. But you have to keep walking by faith. It doesn't happen like that. But God wants us to hear the cry of the people that don't know him, right? Including Muslims. Thank you. Thank you. Now we are talking. Genesis 21. Do you remember this story? When Hagar and Ishmael ran out of water and they were dying, what happened? Did God let them die? No. God intervened, told Hagar, do not be afraid. I hear the Ishmael crying, lift up Ishmael by the hand. I will make into him a great nation. Wow! And God opened Hagar's eyes, and she saw a well of water, and God personally saved their lives. Amen. Didn't he? Yeah. If Ishmael's birth were just merely simply a mistake, God could have let them die. He could have let them die or not. Yes. Why he showed up and saved their lives personally through America? Because he has wonderful plans and the good intentions and has love for Ishmael and his descendants. <laughs> He will not just save their lives so they can cause trouble. Huh? No. <laughs> Pay attention now. Focus with me. Try to focus. This is the most difficult part of today. In First Chronicle, Ishmael's name and his first two sons' names. Nebaiath and Kedar were carefully recorded. You got that part? Yes? Yeah. Nebaiath and Kedar were recorded in First Chronicle. Why this is important? Very important. Because in Isaiah 21, God told us that the Arab people came from Kedar. Arab people came from who? Kedar. Who is one of Ishmael's first sons. Still, why that is important? Very important because Isaiah 60 tells us all Kedar's flocks will be gathered to you. The rams of Nebaiath will serve you. They will be accepted as offering on my altar. Dun, 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 dun. A one of the most significant prophecy in the Bible. And you hardly, you almost never hear Christian leaders talking about it. Never. I never hear one pastor or Christian leader talk about prophecies that Arabs and Muslims will be saved. I don't know why that. <laughs> I'm not going to judge you. Don't judge my hair. I'm not going to judge you. <laughs> now, why this is significant prophecy? Why? I will tell you why. Are you focusing with me? Because the time God gave these words to Prophet Isaiah and told him to say these words, Actually, I did my research. Kedar and Nebaiah already had been dead a thousand years ago. Uh, are you with me? Uh, don't lie. <laughs> I'll say it again. The time God told the prophet Isaiah to say, 
Kedar and Nebaya's flocks would be accepted by me. At that time, the person of Kedar and Nebaya had been dead a thousand years ago. Uh -huh. Then God was not referring to the person of Kedar and Nebaya, but rather to huh? their descendant. Thank you. I am with the right crowd. Thank you for saying that. God was referring to their descendants. Arabs and Muslims will be gathered with their families. They will be saved in the day of the harvest. I came here to speak maybe nine, ten years ago, and I told the congregation, the people, millions of Muslims will come to Christ in the next few years. It happens or not? Yes, it did. Visions and dreams, and uh, God used the Mel Gibson, the Passion of Christ, uh, and God did so many things, and he saved tens of millions of Muslims. Yes, after the Passion of Christ, uh, uh, millions of Muslims were crying as they were watching the movies. Hey, if the Christian leader did not get the job done, God's going to use Mel Gibson. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> God can use anybody, right? God, as the Bible tells us, God can use the foolish things of this world Hallelujah. to put to shame the wise and the strong and the rich. Yes. He's God. He's the one who's going to do it. He chooses the one who's going to use. <laughs> Uh, many years ago, when me and my wife, God spoke to us to start a non-profit ministry, Glad News for Muslims, the first question we had is, which Bible verse we're going to put in our letterhead? I said, oh, this is exciting. We're going to have a non-profit ministry? <laughs> God gave us that verse. Jesus said, I have other sheep too. They are not of this sheep uh, fold or this flock. I must bring them, lead them, they will listen to my voice. You got that? You got that or not? They will listen to my voice. In the future, there will be one flock, one church. God yeah. wants his church to know that multitudes of these sheep are the flocks of Kedar and Nebai. <laughs> OK. Now. I have to move quickly. Jeremiah 49, the next verse, Isaiah 21. Next one, next one, Isaiah 21. God promised to save Muslims in Egypt. In the past 40 years, about 5 million Muslims came to Christ in Egypt. One of them is my wife. Isaiah 19, 25, God said, Blessed be Egypt, my people. Your people? That's what God said. That's not me. Assyria, which is present day Iraq, the work of my hand, Israel, my inheritance. God loves Israel, yes. God loves the Jewish people, yes. <laughs> but God doesn't stop there. <laughs> God loves the Americans, yes. The Spanish, yes. But God also loves the Arab people and the Egyptian people. And uh, they were evangelized from the beginning of the church in their own language, spoke in tongues, the sight. So God wants them to save, to be saved from the beginning. People in heaven will come from all over the world, right? Muslims are growing all over the world. We got prophecies. And we got reality, experience. In the past 40, 50 years, more Muslims became followers of Christ than in the past 1,400 years. We got visions and dreams, passion of Christ. We got so many things. God is working to attract the Muslims to Jesus. And he wants the Christian leaders to, to cooperate with him. And God is saving Muslims. How do I know that? From talking to Egyptian Christian pastors and pastors from other countries? Yes. But also, Mark, if you can come and help me, please. 
I know that for sure because I have been receiving, I have been receiving so many emails that God is using our small ministry and the book God guided me to write to answer their questions to save thousands of Muslims. And, and you probably don't believe that. I didn't believe it. But, but God is waiting for us to take action. He's going to use it. Let me read you a couple of emails. I got Mark as a witness. <laughs> Mark is trustworthy. No. He's from the family. OK, so we sent the book to the universities. I got an email from a full-time minister in the university in Pennsylvania, I think, East Coast. My Turkish friend, Mehmet, said he could consider the Bible and read it after he read Gilead News. After a few months, he got baptized and is now sharing actively with other Muslims while he works on his PhD here in the USA. We were also thrilled. Thank you for writing the book. Another email. Hi, Sammy. Just a brief note of great news. I have been, I have a Muslim friend I have been sharing with for over 15 years. A few months ago, I gave him a copy of Kalad News. After reading it, he called me and said, no one can read this book without his eyes being opened. I spoke to him recently and he told me he has prayed and is now trusting Christ for his salvation. Amen. All these things. Actually, this one is before 9-11 because I wrote the book before 9-11. That's a small church I spoke at and I gave them some books and I think some was in different languages. A secretary sent me a letter as a direct result of your book. One of our team members was able to welcome two new believers into the kingdom of God. Sometimes I get big emails like this one from one of the leaders, uh, pastors. He used to be with Voice of the Martyrs, uh, David Witt. You can Google him. I'm glad to share with you wonderful news of your book, Great News, God Loves You, My Muslim Friend, Impacting Lives in North Africa. I was able to send with them one Arabic glad news to share with the MBBB Muslim background believers. Uh, the, our MBBB contact emailed us a month later saying this one book traveled the nation. <laughs> uh, see, uh, traveled the nation. Two Muslims accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. Now they are requesting 500 books. Traveled the nation. You know what does that mean? Muslims are thirsty people drinking from salty water. They found something about the living water, Jesus Christ and God's love, and they couldn't keep it to themselves. They kept sharing the book with hundreds of people. <laughs> In the last email he sent to me, one of the last emails, your book has made the Mauritanian news. So the Mauritanian government in North Africa discovered that so many Muslims, after they read the book, they start reading the Bible, and they become Christians. So they put a copy of the book and a copy of the Bible in the newspaper, and they warned millions of people in North Africa not to read these two books. I am glad some of you awake and laughed. I was jumping. I said, yes, don't read. <laughs> yeah. Uh, millions of Muslims after that read the books because when you tell somebody don't read these books, <laughs> they're going to read it. I'm going to read you one more email. I can't read you all of them. But you have to know this is part of the big picture. Very important. I received an email from one of the Calvary Chapel leaders in Africa. He served in Uganda, Kenya, Rwanda, Burundi, South Sudan, all over. He's a very well-known Christian leader. His name is Pastor Isaac Wooten. He wrote me, for more than 10 years now, 
we routinely see between 50 and 100 Muslims a year, 50 and 100 Muslims a year, make decisions for Christ because we have learned how to share with them, how to reach them, and share with them through the chapters of your book. Thank you so much, Mom. So I, you know, I'm not going to read you everything. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? Amen. Isn't that exciting? Uh, Spencer, you did this without uh, my signal. That's okay. I forgive you. I forgive you. I can't fire you. I need you. <laughs> That's right. That's my wife. Thank you. Thank you. The next one. Why? Why God is working? Why God is saving Muslims and He want to save many people? Because God is. Oh, He loves people. <laughs> and God told us. God told us. The greatest commandment is love. to love him and from all our being and to love our neighbors love as we love ourselves. Now, Muslims, our neighbors? Yeah. Yes, according to Disneyland, it's a small world after all. <laughs> God wants to save even the bad Muslims. Didn't he save Saul and he made him the Apostle Paul? Saul was a terrorist, killing Christians, arresting them. We don't have time for this. Maybe in the future we do a seminar and they invite other churches to come. When you see a Muslim, tell him, Salam Alaikum, you're going to tell him what? And after today, you will meet a Muslim because God want to prepare you before you meet a Muslim. Because if you are not prepared, you are not gonna tell him salam alaikum. Right? The Muslims are God conscious people. They believe that there is one supreme being creator, created heaven and earth. They got that right. Amen. But they don't know who God is. They are frightened from God. They don't know if they're going to make it to heaven or not. Even Muhammad did not know. They are alive for the gospel. I proved it to you, right? Read this email. They are alive for the gospel. I would say 60% of the Muslim world are alive for the gospel, at least. That's why God want to equip his children. Why they are alive for the gospel? I don't have much time. But one of the reasons Muslims have been killing each other more than ever in the past 50 years. They still kill each other today. <laughs> so they discovered that they are not God's family. So they are looking for answers. But there's other reasons I don't have time. God wants you to be prepared to give them answer. But do this with gentleness and respect. Gentleness and respect. Now let me tell you my story. Oh, I almost forgot. Tell you my story quickly. Uh, maybe a couple of, after a couple more verses. Remind me if I forget. God said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How can they call on him whom they have not believed? How? How we expect the Muslims to call on Jesus? They have not believed. And how can they believe on him of whom they have not, have not heard? They didn't hear and understood who Jesus is. And how can they hear without a preacher? And that's why God wants to equip his church. Now notice, who's going to do the works of the ministry? God. Through you. Oh, I forgot to tell you. All these Muslims that came to Christ came because of me. No. Came be because of believers like you got the book and gave it to Muslims. 
got the book and answered the questions the Muslims have. Believers donated $15 a month for $100 a year or whatever. I am not the one who's supposed to do the ministry. Who's supposed to do the ministry? The church. Remember that. You think the pastor and the pastor Aaron and uh, Mark and John and the leaders, and no, it's you. <laughs> they are just to help. That's it. Pastor Jerry, just to help you. That's it. But it's your responsibility to walk by faith, understand the word of God, and walk with God, and let God use your life. OK, now, oh, I remember my story. I used to work as a defense lawyer in Egypt. Most of my clients were drug dealers. All of them were guilty. <laughs> I never met an innocent client. And God spoke to me from the Bible, Hebrew 11, about Moses. And God told me, I told God, what can I do? I have to help the drug dealers to get out of prison. That's my job. I worked for my father. My father told me, you have to help them in the best way possible. I don't care what you do. Get them out of prison. And that includes using something wrong that the police officer did, or the DA, or the arrest, or the search. Maybe lying a little bit, maybe hiding the truth, compromising. So I did it for two years. And of course, they gave me some hash to smoke. <laughs> <laughs> one thing leads to another. Right? Have you noticed that? When you have one sin in your heart, it leads to another sin. So God told me, what are you doing? Are you having fun? I told him, yeah, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. That's my life. I have to work for my father, you know, and this. and. You know, I have to get into their environment, the drug dealers, so I can understand how to help them. <laughs> God smiled. <laughs> God, God said, you want to live your life like that? Just make money and uh, be respected by drug dealers and be rich? You forgot about our love relationship? You forgot I, that I saved you from paying the penalty for your sins? Uh, you want to live all your life like that? I told God, well, what can I do? God spoke to me from Hebrew 11 about Moses. By faith, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, preferred to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And he considered suffering for the sake of God greater richer than the treasures of Egypt. Amen. God told me, don't play stupid, Sandy. Don't act like you are stupid. What do you want out of your life? Do you want money to become famous, to get high, or do you want to walk by faith? like Moses did, and try to obey me. I know you are not perfect, but at least walk in my path and turn your back to your sinful lifestyle, lying and helping drug dealers and smoking. And, and the start, I told God, I don't know what to do. I started crying. I want to walk with you, my faith. And God said, get out of Egypt, like Moses did. Leave Egypt. If you can't resist the temptation here, leave. I told God, where do I go? And God said, remember, you went to America before as a tourist? I said, yes. And God said, go to America. I went to America. And I was going to be a lawyer here again. God said, no, not again. I did not call you to be a lawyer. I called you to be a shepherd. Keep working in restaurants, start working in restaurants, start a dishwasher, busboy, waiter, 17, 18 years, waiting for God, walking by faith. Every time I fall down, God will pick me up and I repent. 
And God told me, I want you to love me with all your mind. Love you with all my mind? I said, yes. Write the book. That was way before 9-11. Present Jesus in the most understandable, acceptable, attractive, convincing way to educated Muslims. I will give you one case to prove Jesus to Muslims. Before I forget Spencer, please play my pastor testimony. It will be great if we can see his picture again. I never get tired of it. Pastor Shaks. So I wrote the book, and the Muslims start coming to Christ and shaking Pastor Shaq Smith's hand and telling him, thank you for the ministry. We were Muslims, we became Christians. Thank you, Spencer. Wonderful. Thank God for Spencer. Amen. You know, he's using his technical skills, his gift, his mind for the kingdom of God. That's what God wants us all to do. Don't waste your life. Well, I can consider one of our friends uh, who is Muslim. And uh, he, he, we talk here and there. I'm not as knowledgeable as I should be about the Bible. And uh, I would love to be more knowledgeable and try to help him. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because I'm uh, concerned. Uh, but it's hard to um, answer some of his questions concerning uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I, I would love to know what to do, what kind of format to go through, uh, whether giving him a book. I had given him a Bible. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, um, so I, I just want, you know, hopefully he still has that in his house. Okay, we, we do have a fellow here in our church You're keeping me on, uh, you think? who is an Egyptian, and uh, he probably knows more about the Muslim faith than what they know. That's me. Uh, he's very, very <laughs> uh, versed in uh, the Muslim religion, and he's written a book titled, God Loves You, My Muslim Friend. And uh, many Muslims have uh, been converted uh, after reading this book. So I would suggest that if you want to give your uh, friend something that would really help him, because it takes the Muslim beliefs and it sort of takes the Bible and uh, sort of shows comparisons and so forth. And uh, I would highly recommend that you give him this book by Sammy Tanaho, and God loves you, my Muslim friend. Thank you, Spencer, very much. I'm going to mention to you a couple of things really quickly and then end. Uh, so Aaron will invite me to come back again. But I have to tell you, I have to tell you this. I'm glad I remember. Now, why, why God told me to leave my legal career in America after I studied for the California bar exam and to write the book? I found out later. Over, I teach a mission class every year almost, at least before the pandemic, and I read in the mission materials over 60% of Christian believers said reading Christian materials and books helped them to become Christians. So, especially Muslims, they want to see answers, they want to read. Okay, this is the first thing. The second thing is, Muslims are like, you tell me, who, who Muslims are like? They are like Cornelius. I don't know if you remember Cornelius in Acts 10. The Bible described him as a God-fearing, actually God-believing person. He believed in God, okay? Read chapter 10 and read the commentaries. Cornelius was not a Jew. And he was not born again Christian. Yet, he believed in God, the creator, and he tried to have a good conscience. Okay? Some, some Christians, some pastors even don't have a good conscience. Okay? <laughs> so some people are not born again and they have a better conscience than Christians. I hope you, you knew that already. So having a good conscience is very important. Because conscious God gave us a conscience, we know what's wrong, what's right. Especially, we know the Bible. 
So Cornelius did not know all the Bible, especially the New Testament, but he had a good conscience, and he was trying to help the poor. He was trying to pray. He was trying to fast. He was trying to approach the Creator. The Bible record the alms of Cornelius were accepted. Can you believe that? God was looking at Cornelius' efforts to please him, to please the Creator, and God said, I accept what you are doing for me. Because he was acting right, great, according to the light he got. <laughs> Some people have a lot of light, and they are acting horrible. Right? So God knew that Cornelius need Jesus, right? So he told to Peter, Peter, go tell Cornelius about Jesus. Read that chapter, it's very interesting. But before God can use Peter, <laughs> God needed to help Peter overcome his prejudice. Again, it's a God-believing man and a God-fearing man. Like Cornelius. And that's what God is trying to do with the Christian leaders in America and the pastors in America. How dare you say, how come you say that? Oh, <laughs> don't forget, I was a defense lawyer. I back everything with evidence. I don't talk empty talk, evidence. The best evidence, I used to win 90% of my cases. I helped the, the drug dealers cry when I left Egypt. <laughs> what is the evidence? Let me give you just a couple of quick evidence. Because I don't have time. I don't want Aaron to get mad at me. The Christian leaders in America, 99.9% of them, spend billions, trillions of dollars every year on so many things. <laughs> and they don't spend 1% of their budget or time to share Jesus with Muslims. They don't spend it on 25% of world population. Oh my God. And when they spend the money, they just do it. We did spend the money, we did something for Muslims. They don't do it effectively. <laughs> Why? Because their heart is not in it. Remember, pastors will tell you, uh, Christian leaders will tell you, a checkbook shows where your heart is. You, did you hear this before? Well, the checkbook of the Christian leader shows where their heart is. <laughs> it's not with Muslims. Do you have another evidence? I do. The Christian leaders in America spend 99.7% of the resources God gave them, 99.7% of the resources God gave them, they spent them where the church already exists and good. <laughs> and they spent 0.3% to expand the reach of the church among the people that don't have churches among them. They call them, in mission messiology, they call them unreached people group. Muslims are the largest unreached, unengaged people group. Millions of Muslims live in places that don't have any church to be uh, close to them, don't have any evangelists, don't have anything. And that's why I'm so glad, excited, because we start a year ago using satellite TV to reach the whole Middle East and using radio to Africa. I'm so excited. 
If the Christian leaders, most of them are not going to do it, God is going to choose people like David, a shepherd, people like Gideon. God might choose many of you. By the way, don't ever underestimate how much God can use you. This is Satan's biggest lie. God is not going to use you in a big way. Lie! There is a lot need to be done. The, as Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Now, let me end with this. Now, let's say God told me, I don't want you to live like that. You are not living right. I told God, I'm sorry. I can't leave my father's legal firm. I can't leave my properties. I own the properties. I live free, and I have a few condos to rent. I can't leave. I can't leave my legal career. I can't leave that. And God will say, too bad. I had a great, I had a wonderful plan for your life. But you're going to trade it for garbage. Now, I left by God's grace. What Jesus said, if you lived your life for yourself, you will lose it. But if you give your life for, for me, for Jesus, and the gospel sake, you will find the true life. I am living the best life I can ever have. Right now, me and my wife, we are excited. Every couple of days, we get an email, a praise report. Either a Muslim came to Christ or, or, or something good happened. We are excited. We have challenges, all kinds of challenges. We have problems, you name it, we got it. We live in 900, uh, no, my wife told me, no, it's 875 square feet a tiny condo which has our ministry office. We don't have an office. We hardly can move inside the condo because of the fires and the books. And uh, so I have to be careful before I get from the living room to the kitchen. Or I might fall. And I do fall a couple of times a week. But I I am excited to wake up every morning. <laughs> Why? Because I know God is going to work in me. God is going to help me to grow. And God is going to guide me. God is going to open a door. God is going to give me interesting phone calls, email. God is going to use me to help more Muslims come to Christ or to equip more Christians. And life is interesting and exact. What Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it more abundant, abundant life. Amen. Is living in the center of God's will. I want you to get as many books as possible. Unfortunately, I can't give the book free because we have to buy it for Moody and we have to pay shipping and we have to put it in the storage and the storage is expensive. So we have to sell it. We do give the book in 13 languages free to Muslims. But I couldn't, I don't have the budget, the money to give it both to Muslims and Christians. So try to buy as many as you can and by faith, if you can buy 20 by 20 and the, Give them to Muslims or give them to Christians. Because the book equipped the Christian. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for Pastor Aaron, for his patience with me. Thank you for Pastor Jerry, God. Heal him, God, and heal his lovely wife. Thank you, God, for Mark, Jerry's brother-in-law, and John, his brother. Thank you, God, for the people that you are using here, Spencer and Jose, the usher, to serve you, God, every week. God, we surrender our lives to you, and we know, God, that you can use us. You can use the weak. You, you do use the weak. 
to produce abundant eternal fruits. And we ask you in Jesus' name to do that, God. Use us, God, before Jesus comes back again, before we grow older, before the opportunity is gone. Use us, God, to help a multitude of people and Muslims spend eternity with you. In Jesus' name, we pray.